A&E's biography is brought to you in part by Wausau Insurance, the business insurance professionals specializing in managed care programs. He's tall and he's quite silly. His genius lies in portraying authority figures gone mad. And he's helped redefine comedy in a most delightful way. The Extraordinary Life of John Cleese, next on Biography. I'm Peter Graves. Welcome to Biography. Just about ten years after the Beatles hit the U.S., another British phenomenon arrived on our shores. Monty Python's Flying Circus, a troupe of off-the-wall writers and performers who revolutionized comedy the way the Fab Four had changed music. Now, one of the group's key members was John Cleese. He specialized in playing authority figures who always seemed on the verge of losing it. An irate customer in a pet shop trying to return a dead parrot. Or in another memorable sketch, England's official minister of silly walks. After Python, he went on to create and star in the now classic Faulty Towers and later he wrote, produced, and starred in the hit movie, A Fish Called Wanda. Tonight, Cleese looks back on his life and the roots of his comedy. <laughs> Not without a certain amount of glamour, combined with expert knowledge, the policewoman controls the traffic of one of Western Supermare's busy intersections. Beautifully laid out gardens are a feature of Western's main shopping thoroughfares. Western Supermare, which is a little seaside resort uh, with a population of 30,000. Three cinemas, snooker hall. I kind of felt that uh, there was enough activity there for me as a boy feel that I was quite an interesting and varied life. Dad sold insurance. He, he used to describe himself on forms as a marine underwriter because uh, when he'd been out in the east, and he had a very interesting uh, early life, he'd, he'd been in marine insurance for the Union of Canton Insurance Company. He had an interesting life because he went off to fight the First World War and uh, that was incidentally also when he changed the family name because he was he was born reginald cheese my grandfather was john edwin cheese who was a solicitor's clerk but a very crafty one who owned the entire office block in which he worked <laughs> as a solicitor's clerk unfortunately the family story went he put the money into railways instead of into beer so we never had any we literally had nothing except dad's salary in the 50s which was 30 quid a week which was quite comfortable i mean we had a little lost in 10 and dad used to uh, just drive around somerset selling insurance and was that the circuit was it insurance accountancy mm -hmm. solicitors clerks was that's that right. your father's friend mother's friends and that's right and the, the the reason i think why uh, accountancy used to feature so hugely in my sketches is that from the age of 15 there was this enormous very gentle pressure because my parents were very kind but there was a huge gentle pressure to become an accountant <laughs> I am a chartered accountant. I am also a chartered accountant. I am a chartered accountant too. I am a gorilla. All four of us are chartered accountants, except me. And we are having tea. This is the sugar. Sugar. <laughs> this is a cup of tea. A cup of tea. <laughs> and this is a greenhouse. Do you see your background as having provided you with some terrific targets? Yes. I think it also, uh, I felt at times that it it enables me to feel as though I'm in tune with what's going on in England. I don't think I feel that anymore because I think I'm too old now. 
but there was a stage and I felt that very strongly because there's a sign of typicalness about where I came from. I see it in a funny kind of way as being archetypally British middle class or lower middle class. I think you feel that there is an enormous um, pressure to conform and to be respectable and not to shock. And I think a lot of what I've been doing is attempting to escape from that. At the same time, there's a very strong Puritan work ethic. Very, very strong. I think people find it terribly hard really to enjoy themselves. And I think that that's something that's been with me a long, long time. <laughs> Uh, this is my wife, Audrey. She smells a bit, but she has a heart of gold. <laughs> there must have been some kind of misunderstanding, because this is number 41. Who's that, then? What? Who's the bird? You very seldom saw people in Western Supermare um, really kissing each other. I mean, husbands and wives sort of pecked each other on the forehead, you know? Or patted each other on the hand. It was that very distant thing, as though emotion could come along and send everything spinning off out of control. And I think that's why, certainly I, have always had this feeling that my emotions were rather held in. Uh, Self-repression and externally applied repression. That's right. And the escape from that is some spasm of anger, violence. Mm -hmm. Well, I think why... why or an erection of fear as well, isn't it? Well, yes, fear fears there, certainly, but I think one of the reasons why Basil Fawlty was uh, a very successful creation in the long run was that he embodied a kind of thing that the English feel sometimes, which is that because they can't say, I'm sorry, this, is, this food is not good enough, or I bought this pair of shoes, I want you to replace it, you know, because they can't do these simple acts of self-assertion, they tend to become on the surface kind of brittle politeness and underneath a lot of seething rage. And I think that so many people in England feel this, that that was one of the reasons why they could identify with Basil, also find him funny, and at the same time quite like, because he's a monster. And yet people feel quite affectionately about him, which is a very strange paradox. What have you done to my hotel? What? Look! Oh, it's nice. I like it there. Oh, You're hurting me! What have you done with my dining room door? Where is it? I don't know. Why don't you know I left you in charge? Well, I fell asleep. You fell asleep? Well, it's not my fault. You fell asleep and it's not your fault? You forgot to wake me. Who forgot to wake you? It is my fault. Manuel, I knew it, Manuel! Don't blame him. Why not? It's not really his fault. Well, whose fault is it then, you clothier, beans, dinners, cockton? Well, you hired O'Reilly, didn't you? I mean, we all warned you. Who else would do something like this? I beg your pardon? You hired O'Reilly. Oh, I see. It's my fault, is it? Oh, of course. There I was thinking it was your fault because you'd be left in charge. Or Manuel's fault for not waking you and all the time it was my fault. Oh, it's so obvious now. I've seen the light. Well, I must be punished then, mustn't I? You're a naughty boy. Don't do it. I don't One of the things about the performance that you give as Basil is that you as an actor use his body a great deal to make effect. You are very tall and you can... Well, I do like... move oddly. I yes. mean, I wish I But you a... move even more oddly in Fontaine. Well, Slightly, but I wish I was a lovely mover, and I'm not. And uh, I don't have to exaggerate it much, unfortunately, to look like Basil. I remember the first time I ever saw myself, which was in New Zealand, where we were doing this 63 show, and we were there in 64, and the New Zealand Broadcasting Company came and taped it. And it is a most extraordinary experience seeing yourself on tape for the first time, because nothing, nothing, is as you perceive it. And I look like a cross between a sort of giraffe and a hovercraft because I moved along as though I was on an air cushion with the top half of me sort of waving very slightly from side to side. Uh, but the gestures I made were terribly small. If I pointed at things, I was doing this. Look at that. And at the same time, I, I talked almost the whole time without moving my lips at all. So a very strange creature which had nothing to do with me at all and was me. You were very tall, very young, weren't very you? Very tall, very young. I was six foot when I was 12. Taller than all the teachers in my prep school when I was 12. Um, and this, I remember one of them referring to me as a prominent citizen and everybody laughing. And the trouble about being very tall is you can't withdraw into the background. You were there. At the same time, I was an only child and really quite solitary in my habits until I got to prep school. And I wasn't well liked at all. In fact, I was quite badly bullied because, although nobody can believe this, is a very meek and rather indecisive and um, 
bullyable side to me. I remember my father arriving once to say hello, you know, to bring me something, and he found three boys sitting on top of me <laughs> to chase them away. Uh, so I was this rather strange, elongated, solitary, and rather bullied object. And although I was never very naughty, because I was too cowardly really to put, to take real risks, I was never beaten in my entire ten years, you know, and that's pretty rare. Um, nevertheless, I was able to be naughty enough, and by making people laugh in that subversive way that, in a sense, I've gone on doing all my life, I gained popularity and was liked. When biography continues, John Cleese's comedy career begins. From the Footlights Club at Cambridge to Monty Python's Flying Circus. Next. And now the man I retained one year ago to recommend this corporation's property, casualty, and group health insurance companies. Here with his findings, the most sought-after efficiency expert in business, Mr. Fred Fox. Wasser. Thank you, Mr. Fox. For all your business insurance, one word says it all. It still bugs me that I waited to try Old Spice High Endurance just because I thought all deodorants worked the same. Dumb. This proves it's the best. Try it. If you don't think it's the best, call 1-800-PROVE-IT and they'll buy you a stick of yours. Take the High Endurance Challenge from Old Spice. I did. Problem sleeping. Announcing Nitol Quick Caps with a smooth new shape. Nitol Quick Caps dissolve quickly and help you get to sleep fast. Try Nitol Quick Caps, the quick way to fall fast asleep. You know you can get cash just across the street. But did you know you can get cash all across the country? Using the same card you use at the cash machines at home. That is, when your card has a plus. Because plus marks a spot for cash when you travel. At cash machines in big cities and small towns. In all 50 states and beyond. So check your card and name your street. Reinhold Bertlev had a key role in the building of Porsche's new 911 Carrera. Did he design the engine? The radical suspension? No. Instead, Reinhold and his co-workers have perhaps the best job in the world. They test drive every new 911. On the Autobahn. If Reinhold likes your car, we're pretty sure you like your car. We now return to biography here on A&E. In 1953, aged 14, Cleese became a day boy at Clifton College, a public school in Bristol. The thing about Clifton was it was not an unkind school, but there was a, a complete lack of any real excitement of an intellectual nature and I think most of the lessons that I was taught which was there was a sort of mythical house spirit and school spirit and Christian spirit Christian spirit and all this business about lying I remember you know lying was considered very bad and then uh, then the school inspectors came and, and one of the masters said no whatever question I ask you put your hands up um, but if you know the answer put your right hand up <laughs> And I began to realize this, this law against lying was merely administrative inconvenience, you know. I mean, it was nothing to do with morality. And I never knew what I wanted to do. And because I was quite good at maths, when I got to Clifton, I got put down the tube that said maths, physics, and chemistry. And I emerged at the other end, holding three A-levels, thinking, you know, what was that about? And then I got a place at Cambridge. You went to read law, you're switching away from... Yeah, I switched law. to law, because I, I didn't know what to do. So again, I went on doing three years of something that I wasn't interested in, appeared with a piece of paper at the end saying, you are a BA, you know, and nobody ever asked me, having been told my entire life how important all these qualifications were, nobody ever asked me what I got or what my O-levels were. It's very strange. While at Cambridge, Cleese began to write and perform with the Footlights Club, alongside Bill Oddie, Tim Brooke Taylor and Graham Chapman. Uh, looking back now on Cambridge with this very male, uh, a particular class of male, a particular sort of English male, uh, a club. What were you after as a group? 
I know you're after making people laugh. Yes. Well, the trouble was, it's very hard to see that we were after anything else. We uh, reacted, all of us, very strongly against any kind of didactic purpose. And laughed at it. Thought it was rather awful. Um, I think some of us, certainly myself, were almost inconceivably inexperienced so far as women were concerned and therefore what we, we would, would have been very little point in writing about women since I, they were from another planet as far as I was concerned except in so far as I'd seen them on screen like I was able to parody a Somerset Maugham type heroine in one scene but it's very hard for me to characterize my early humor because I pinched it from everyone I mean I got the idea of a parody of Somerset Maugham because I saw somebody else parodying him you know and then when I first started to write for BBC Radio, he did a series of conversations at a bus stop for Dick Emery and Derek Geiler. And in fact, they were, I don't think I've ever told Peter Cook this, but they were all based on Peter, Peter Cook's, uh, yeah, well, it was pre-Pete and Dad, actually. It was all, all based on Peter Cook's um, interesting facts sketch. And he comes and tells the man this, these interesting facts, which I finally, to my great delight, actually did with him in a, a secret policeman book kind of 20 years later. I'll tell you another interesting fact, though. It's about the whale. Did you know that the whale is not really a fish? It's an insect. <laughs> and it lives on bananas. The whale is an insect. I never heard such rubbish. I know. It's a joke. After leaving Cambridge, Cleese toured with the Footlights Review, Cambridge Circus. He also worked for BBC Radio and was featured in the television series The Frost Report and At Last the 1948 Show, which starred Cleese, Marty Feldman, Tim Brooke Taylor and Graham Chapman and was very much a precursor of Monty Python's Flying Circus. Almost everything I wrote up to about the time I left BBC was derivative for someone else. And then I think I began to find a little bit of a star which was based on on the fact that I discovered that people could take much harder jokes than were current at that time. Now with all the young comics now, they won't know what I'm talking about because they do have hard humour. But uh, people were much more cautious in the early 60s about doing slightly hard jokes, jokes that implied something to do with uh, rage or hatred or real envy or, you know, something that was a bit nasty. Uh, the tenants arrive in the entrance hall here, are carried along the corridor on a conveyor belt in extreme comfort and past murals depicting Mediterranean scenes towards the <laughs> rotating knives. The last 20 feet of the corridor are heavily soundproof. The blood pours down these chutes and the anguish flesh snurts into these large Excuse containers. Excuse me. Hmm? Uh, did you say knives? Uh, rotating knives, yes. <laughs> are you uh, proposing to slaughter our tenants? Does that not fit in with your plans? <laughs> no, no, we, we wanted a simple block of flats. Ah, I see. I hadn't uh, correctly divined your attitude towards your tenants. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I mainly design slaughterhouses. Yes, did it? I can just think of those, those first time I heard the nun jokes, you know, yeah. I mean, I, ma I made a number up, what's, uh, what was it, what is black and white and crawls along the ground, a wounded nun, I mean, I thought that was hysterical, I used to laugh at that out in the street for about a fortnight, every time I thought of it, then I started making them up, you know, what is black and white and black and off-white and black and light brown and black and sepia and black and brown and black and black, you know, a nun on a spit or something, and I could just, you know, and that, that sort of hard edge to the joke didn't frighten me, and it frightened some of the executives. They'd say, should we do that? And I managed to talk them into doing it, and then it would get a laugh, and they'd think, oh, it was all right. So I could see that people could, as I said, dissociate themselves from the nasty thing and simply see the thing as an abstract idea. But it was very interesting that sometimes people couldn't. Was there a setting which you and Graham uh, Chapman worked together in the Monty Python mm, one absolutely. side of it uh, whereas Terry Jones and Michael Palin wrote on another side of it. Could you characterize the distinctions in terms of helping to characterize your own work? Yes, I mean we used to write parodies of each other's sketches um, Mike and Terry's sketches always started with long pans over countryside with uh, romantic music in the background and then probably a Viking or someone appearing on a horse, and the thing developing slightly lyrically and with a much more 
visual slot that Grave and I had, and our, and our, our sketches would consist of people coming in and abusing each other out of the sauruses, basically. We were both the found abuse, very, very funny, and we loved people arguing and fighting and being rude to each other. Well, and we, we, we love also the possibilities of language in that situation, because when you start getting just a little bit more recherche in your vocabulary, and at the same time having the actors very, you know, very angry, something very funny happens, I think. Why do you think you find abuse and savagery funny? Oh, I, th I should assume it's because I've had great difficulty um, with anger myself. And that uh, by laughing at, at, at anger in this way, I, I make it less dangerous for myself. I'm pretty sure that's right. But it's, I'm sure I didn't know that for years. It's just that we wanted a block of flats and not an abattoir. <laughs> yes, but of course, that's just the sort of blinkered Philistine pig ignorance I've come to expect. <laughs> Garbage, you sit there on your loathsome spotty behind, squeezing blackheads, not caring a tinker's cuss about the struggling artist. You excrement! You lousy hypocritical whining conies! With your lousy colour TV sets and your Tony Jack and Dog Clubs and your bleeding Masonic handshakes! You wouldn't let me do it, would you, you black, boring bastards? Well, I wouldn't have come to Freemason now if you went down on your lousy, stinking, pullulant knees and begged me! Well, we're sorry you feel like that, but we uh, did want to adopt that. Nice though the abattoir is! <laughs> There was a lot of anger in all of us and a fair amount of paranoia in the group and plenty of envy, a lot of envy, because we'd never talked about anything that any of us did outside the group. It was a kind of taboo and I started trying to break it a few years ago by deliberately in front of everyone else asking people, what have you been doing, you know? And we do it now. But there was a time where it was absolutely taboo to mention any project you've been working on outside the group while the other, other group members were there. So there was a lot of strong emotion and I think that, that, that we could have fun with it and to some extent make it less frightening by laughing at it. There were certain things that uh, that you did out of just silliness which then developed into the fish, fish slapping dance and things like that, weren't they? Which you just done for the... Uh, I mean, I... those, you know, gumbies. That all came out of the fact that I had this um, Vox Pop to camera and I just couldn't see how to make it the slightest bit interesting but I had to shoot it in 20 minutes. I ran back to the um, wardrobe that and simply put this outfit on and just did the whole box pop as though I was terribly angry about something that was unspecified. Blimey! <laughs> Blimey! If they're not key enough to stay here when they are, why should we allow them back? Oh, I had the taxpayer's expense! I mean, be fair! I mean, I don't eat squirrels, do I? What we did normally was written and performed as written and structured and that we were at our silliest when we were just got the camera and hadn't had a chance to write something in a formal sense inspector inspector mm -hmm. i'm terribly sorry but i was sitting on a park bench over there took my coat off for a minute and then i found my wallet had been stolen and 15 pounds taken from it well did you uh, did you see anyone take it anyone hanging around or no no there was no one there at all trouble well there's not very much we can do about that sir Do you want to come back to my place? <laughs> yeah, all right. Do you want to come back to my place? <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Which I think is glorious. It's so... I don't know where it comes from. But, you know, if you put that down on paper, it probably wouldn't have survived the reading process. Why do you think you were particularly drawn to authority figures? I mean, you're, uh, you, you're very at home playing yeah. people in authority. Well, I think firstly because I could, I could play them easily, you see. I mean, I'd had the training mm. that those authority figures have. If you've been to, 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 to Clifton and Cambridge, you, it would be very easy to become a barrister, you know, or a very um, upper echelon businessman or a conservative politician or you know it's very easy to do those so all I had was to put a suit on I had the right acts and I could play them so that's one of the reasons I wrote second thing is I realized very very early on that if somebody a character that you're going to write <coughs> is going to do that then it's funny if he's head of the secret service and not funny if he's a milkman so that the more authority that you give these characters the more that they have hanging on them the more people's lives 
turn to the other good way. Then the funnier it is when the two pitch of that. Yeah. And you went for confrontation a lot. There seemed a stage in your writing where the greatest wrong in human society was the impossibility of getting good service in a shop. Mm. Well, I began to realize it was true for a start. But I particularly got interested in that because I started to uh, make films for video arts and became very interested about this thing called business. Yeah. The 90% of the British population spends all its time doing that us folks in the arts, the creative ones, narrowly defined to make us feel special. The creative ones know nothing about business. And I find it very interesting sitting down with a couple of smashing very bright girls who who uh, taught everybody how to sell across the counter at uh, Marks and Spencer's and they were terrific and what they told me about psychology in two hours was solid gold. Ten minutes I've been here and I'm in a hurry. Well you've got to wait your turn haven't you? What? You can't just swan in and get served like that. I mean we're busy. Swan in? I might tell you I've been a customer of this bank for 30 on. years. Come on. What do you want? There's people waiting. How dare you speak to me like that? Just because you're at a fancy tie doesn't make you more important than the others you know. Now what do you want? I want to see the manager. I refuse to put up with this impertinence. Well I'm afraid Wrong. The bank now has one very angry, very time consuming customer. Because Brian couldn't handle him. Because he didn't react like a professional. Instead of staying cool, he allowed himself to get personally involved. So he was rude, and rudeness never works. So, rule one. Don't get personally involved. Stay a professional distance. Biography's look at the life of John Cleese will continue in a moment. When Rosemary Mitchell gave birth, she was covered by an innovation. Health insurance, pioneered by Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans. An innovation that's grown to protect the health of her daughter, her granddaughter, her great-granddaughter, and help prevent the premature delivery of her great-great-granddaughter. Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Local plans with health care options as diverse as their communities. Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Live long, live well. They really paid attention to the details. I just love the feeling of getting in and going. This year, three times as many people as last year have bought a Mitsubishi Galant. Now there's one more excellent reason. Our 24-month lease on the 1995 Galant. Just $1.99 a month with only $1,000 down. It was a lot of things. The quality. The security. And for a limited time, the 24-month Galant lease. From Mitsubishi. The new thinking in automobiles. There's smoke. Check it out. They're bootlegging cigarettes. No tax stamp. There's fire. Each of the defendants has known connections to organized crime. Not guilty. I want Masucci. And I want to keep on breathing. An a and &E special law and order movie event. Greed makes people see things that aren't there. You got greedy. They knew it and they set you up. That was greed. There is no torrent like greed. Greed? The torrents of greed. Sunday on a and &E. Now return to biography here on A and E. Dear Marty Feldman, when I first met Marty, he went on at great length about what he used to call the internal logic of a sketch, which is that you could have everybody sitting in dustbins or dressed as carrots, but if somebody walks into the room who isn't dressed as a carrot or who isn't wheeled in in a dustbin, then you have to explain why not. See what I mean? So you yeah. start with anything, no matter how crazy but that it's got to be founded on that in solid logic. I, I have a, a silly walk and I'd like to obtain a government grant to help me develop it. <laughs> I see. Uh, may I see your silly walk? Yes, certainly, yes. <clears throat> it's all got to fit internally. There mustn't be inconsistent bits or contradictions or things that are out of harmony with the rest of it and unexplained. And I think that's how people's minds work. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> <laughs> 
that's it, is it? Yes, that's it, yes. Mm hmm It's not particularly silly, is it? I, I mean, the right leg isn't silly at all, and the left leg merely does a forward aerial half turn, every alternate step. Yes, but I think with, with government backing, I could make it very silly. <laughs> Mr. Pudi, the very real problem <laughs> is one of mine. I'm afraid that the Ministry of the is no longer to get any kind of support that it needs. You see, there's defence, social security, health, housing, education, city wars. They're all supposed to But last year, the government spent less on the Ministry of the Wars than it did on national defence. Now, we get 348 million a year, which is supposed to be spent on all our available products. Yes, please. Uh, Mrs. Two Lumps, would you bring us in two coffees, please? Yes, Mr. Teabag. <coughs> Out of a mind. <laughs> now, the Japanese have a man who can bend his leg back over his head and back again with every single step, while the Israelis have that... Ah, here's the coffee. <laughs> Thank you, love that. With sketches, you literally start from a single funny idea and see if it goes anywhere. But I think I realised that there's a kind of natural um, progress that seems to happen with a lot of comedy writers. It's almost clearest in Woody Allen, which is that for the first 10, 15 years, sort of 22 to 35, you are happy doing sketches, and then a bit, a bit of you becomes hungry to do something meatier. Now, once you move on to something meatier, you get in involved in problems not just of plot and story but of kind of consistency of material and I think in a way without being that conscious of it the last three or four years when I've written very very little really the book with Robin is one of the only major things and a few things for meaning of life um, I've been uh, pursuing this and trying to sort out what I really do think about uh, about things in general Working with Robin in particular, I've seen that there are some ideas, some ways of living, which seem to me to lead people towards a much happier life. And these are not very widely known. I meet people who are highly educated, but they seem strangely ignorant about really quite basic uh, psychological, psychiatric uh, ideas, particularly this particular one about paranoia and projection. So if we have a great deal of anger and hatred, which we do not know about, we project it into other people. And that then justifies us to use our own anger and hatred. I mean, when you start viewing the way that politicians in particular behave, in the light of the sort of ideas that, that Robin has taught me through doing the book, um, it becomes deeply, deeply funny. Such as? When Margaret Thatcher goes on television with that performance that she does now, which has got nothing to do with a live human being at all, I mean, it's all been taught. I don't know who's taught it. Somebody said, put your head on one side. They don't talk so fast. Try and pitch your voice low. Don't sound so strident. You know, relax more. Take a few deep breaths. Try to talk even slower. Put your head more on one side. And what comes out? People will sit there watching it. I mean, I get more laughs from that now than I do from comedy shows. The leader of the Conservative Party, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> you know about Conservatives? Hey, we'll give you a good time. No what I mean, eh? Better than that Labour lot. Labour! I wouldn't give it up. I wouldn't give it up. You know something about that lot. Bloody socialists, that's what they are. Best definition I ever read was um, Bergson in laughter and he says laughter is a social sanction against rigid behavior non-flexible behavior behavior that's not really well adapted to the situation it's a social sanction which brings in the idea that it's a group reaction disapproving of something um, I think that almost anything that we would think of as egotistical is funny because we are suddenly seized with lust or anger or envy, or hatred, or silliness, or whatever. Excessive sadness, you know, inappropriate mourning. We're seized with an emotion which takes us over, and which we no longer have any control of, so that we no longer have any flexibility about whether our behavior is, is intelligent or not. 
So in a nutshell, funnily enough, I think what's funny are the seven deadly sins because they're the great sins of egotism. And I think the wonderful thing about being around someone like Christ, who I suspect uh, was uh, free of egotism to, uh, to us an incredible degree, was that in any circumstances his behavior would have been so light and flexible he could just have moved from from feeling to feeling without any without needing to respond to them or anything and he would have been completely free of these these lunatic obsessions that we're all caught with is it too crass to say how would you square that with the send-up of the crucifixion at the end of life of brian um in the life of brian i mean we were making fun of the way people follow religious leaders. We weren't making fun of religious leaders themselves. That's why we showed Christ in the first part of the film, to establish this was not Christ. But Brian was someone whom people followed as though he was a Messiah. And I'd just like to add on a personal note my own admiration for what you're doing for us, Brian, and what must be, after all, for you, a very difficult time. Bridge, what are you going to do? Goodbye, Brian, and thanks. The trouble is that that crucifix is, is a symbol of Christ and what we're really saying in there is maybe death isn't so terrible. Maybe as the Buddhists say, it's a final letting go. Mm. And that's rather nice when you think about it that way. I think maybe when you've had a good full life, tragedies people die young, but I think when you've had a good full life, maybe you think, okay, I've had my innings if you're English, you know, and it was okay and now it's time to go. And you could feel okay about it. Maybe even go with a smile. For life is quite absurd, and death's the final word. You must always face the curtain with a bow. Forget about your scene, give the audience a grin. Enjoy it, it's your last chance anyhow. So always look on the bright side of death. Just before you draw your terminal breath. Is there anything that you consider is outside human? There's some things that I wouldn't do because I think they'd be misunderstood. I mean, it's totally cultural. I remember stories about the Roman amphitheater, where you remember the guy who they, they who designed this um, bronze bull, and mm. the great joke was you put someone inside it and put a fire underneath, you see, and then the government, mm. and it sounded like a bull lowing. He thought this is terribly funny, so I'm delighted to say they put him in. And as he went, ah, uh, and it sounded like a bull lowing, the Roman sitting laughed, sitting around the amphitheater laughed. So what we're talking about is, is very cultural sense of humor and I think that I couldn't make jokes about a recent disaster or about something like cancer because there would be no chance even if I did find a, make, a way of making a joke about it there would be no chance people would see what the joke was that I was making they would think I was making another one W.C. Fields somebody bet him he couldn't make people laugh at a blind man he was very clever because he made the blind man a threat I have a blind spot on on most sexual jokes and innuendo jokes, which I think are terrible. Terrible. And embarrassing. Yeah, embarrass me. Blue jokes. Yeah, blue but jokes. I think that's, that's because right. I'm prudish. But, uh... Well, I wonder if there's a prudish streak in me, but I'm, I, I used to think it was that, and I, as I've sort of become more and more degenerate, I've come to the conclusion that I'm not particularly prudish, but yeah. that a lot of people are incredibly uptight about sex. And now for something completely different. When biography continues, John Cleese writes and stars in Forty Towers. This week on Biography. Tomorrow, the Nicholas Brothers. On Thursday, Gregory Peck. And on Friday, Brigitte Bardot. Once, most stomach remedies were gritty, soupy, chalky, bitter, or a bother. But time marches on. Introducing Pepto-Bismol caplets, the easy-to-swallow pills that relieve most any common stomach problem. They're big news for your stomach. Clorox Toilet Cleanser has bleach and abrasives to help make stains disappear. As we developed the new Porsche 911 Carrera, our German test center was buzzing with new thinking. A radical new suspension. A more powerful engine. 
the suggestions came from far and wide. Of course, the new 911 is still available in red, black and white, but uh, what fun would that be? She's just what you'd expect in a private eye. You're not Miss Lee, are you? She's in great shape. Knows how to dress the part. Your skirt's a short, isn't it? And knows how to handle those sticky situations. You pompous prat. Come on, punk. Make my day. Bunny! Anna Lee looks for a missing girl and finds a family <gasps> secret. Why is she so frightened of you, Miss Dahl? On the A&D Mystery Movie. Tonight on A&D. Eleanor, how's your daughter doing? She graduates next spring. Okay, can we get started again so that we're not here all night? She'll be after his job soon. As we can. We will. Now, I think the company's got a pretty fair offer on the table here, people. I don't know, Don. Look, isn't there anything that we can agree on here? Other than getting a new coffee machine. <laughs> <laughs> I know one thing. Warsaw, for group health and workers' compensation. One thing employers and employees agree on. Maybe no one ever told you that you are a healer. There is no stronger medicine than the power of your words. No touch softer than the sound of your voice. No better remedy for bruised feelings and broken hearts. Introducing Time Bank. Only Time Bank awards you one free minute for every five you spend on the phone. It's about time we were recognized for something we do so well. We now return to biography here on A&E. Well, uh, how's that lovely daughter of yours? She's dead. Oh, my <laughs> God, super. Isn't that super? The way those stripes go up and down, it's really super. How much did that cost, then? Who are you? I mean, I don't know your name. What is it? <laughs> huh? My name. <laughs> oh, this is my husband, Basil Fawlty. That's it. What? Well, ah, thank you, do. How do you do? Uh, may I introduce my wife? Well, she just introduced you. Oh, what a coincidence. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't believe you know my wife. Dead. Yes. May I introduce Mrs. Hall? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Didn't see you down there. Don't get up. <laughs> How would you describe Basil? He's very depressed. And uh, I think that the reason that people feel sympathy or even, it's almost inconceivable, liking for this poor monster is that they sense that he's not in control of his own life. And I once did a kind of quick little popularity poll on the characters. And the most popular character is Manuel. And the kids identify with Manuel amazingly. And I'm sure that's because Manuel's seen as having no control over his life at all. Good morning. I beg your pardon? Good morning. One moment, please. Would <laughs> you say good morning? See. Si. I see. Si. Well, what are you going to do now? Okay. What you do now? I shall breakfast. Oh, well, let's see you then. See. Si. <laughs> Where is Dor? Dor is gone. The door was here! Well, um... Hey! Oh, oh, good morning, Major. I'm so sorry. I was afraid the dining room door seems to have disappeared. Oh. Most in control, and in a sense least liked, although perhaps most admired as a performance, is, is Prue. Because Sybil seems to be running the show. And so there's not much spare sympathy, which is... I think that's quite interesting. It tells us a lot about how people respond to other people, that it's helplessness that really makes us feel good about them, you know. And if they can look after themselves, we don't like them. <laughs> Sorry to bother you. I thought I'd better apologize for my husband's behavior. No, please, no. really, Mrs. Forty. He's going through rather a disturbed time at the moment. <laughs> no, please, look, I, I don't quite understand. He does seem a bit worked up about no. something, but I'm sure there's some quite innocent yes. explanation. Basil? Hi, Neil. Just checking the doors. <laughs> All right, what's going on? Uh, I was in the bathroom. 
Yes, she was there. So I just popped in to have a, have a look at these hinges. You know, the ones we've been... Do you really imagine, even in your wildest dreams, that a girl like this could possibly be interested in an aging, brilliantine stick insect like you? In Faulty Towers, Connie and I used to spend enormous quantities of time on the plot. I mean, most people will write a half hour in ten days top whack, and a lot of them will tell you. Provided there's nobody from the company employing them around, they write them in a week. Well, Connie and I used to take six weeks of 40 times, and we just started with this huge sheet of paper. They always used to write, because there was never room to get everything in, we used to write, they get that drawing paper. Yeah. And we'd start writing one or two things down, like an idea at the beginning and maybe an idea in the middle. And we would go through it and through it and have other ideas we put off at the side. And ever so slowly, over two weeks, a plot would be constructed. Was there any time when you were writing them that you said to yourself, oh, that's the way, that's the formula, that's the sort of way we do it? No, not a formula. There were certain things we took pride in. Yeah. I was thinking as you were saying that. We always took pride in trying not to let the audience guess what was going to happen. And we realized the way around that was that in most comedy, the plot comes plot and you can spot that a bit mm. of plot has been put in so whenever we were getting plot points across or establishing something that was absolutely necessary to lead on to the final direction of the story we would always make it as funny as possible so that people thought it'd be, it had been put in because it was funny but at the same time they would absorb the point the plot point you keep talking about the plot but there are uh, Several plots, half a dozen. Yes, plots, where you have right. five or six adventures setting out, and when then you, you try and get two or three, we used to get two or three, sometimes four, but probably two or three threads, uh, threads, <laughs> and then at a particular point they come together, yeah. and then they start playing off each other, and they may not just come together and run; they may sort of come together and overlap a little bit, and then two and three may touch, and then three and one may touch, but basically they start separate on separate tracks and then start weaving. And of course the best ones are where they all come together right at the end, like with Mrs. Richards, the deaf person, which I watched with my daughter about a week ago. Uh, it's very satisfactory with all the things that have been set up. When he finally has to tell her that the money is his, and he turns to Manuel, you know, and he says, just tell her the money's mine. And Manuel says, I know nothing. <laughs> In which Basil told him to say 20 minutes before. Uh, it, you know, it's just the satisfaction of it all just touching it, just at the end. You remember, I had some money yesterday, the money I won on the horse. Oh, I see. Yes. Tell Mrs. Richards, tell her I had the money yesterday. Uh, um, I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. No, 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 no. Nothing. No, no, forget that. No, I forget everything. I know nothing. No, no, you can tell her. You can no, tell her. I cannot. You just tell her. Tell her. Tell her. Oh, tell her. Please, please. Tell her. Tell her. Tell her. Tell her. Tell her. You just see the poor guy being put into more and more uncomfortable and terrible situations the whole time. Connie and I would, would laugh till the tears ran down our face, but we would always ache for him. Because, you know, we were really like two gods. We were writing this man's life and making it absolutely it's awful. He never had a chance. <coughs> right! I'm going to give it a shirt off my back, too. You see, I know nothing. I'm going to send you to a vivid sectionist. <laughs> now. <laughs> but the, the funny thing is, I did realize this years ago, that it's no good having somebody behaving crazily. What is much, much funnier is watching somebody, mm. watching someone who is behaving crazily. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Paulty. Good afternoon. You got a Mrs. Richard staying here. Oh. I like physical acting. I think sometimes if you can do something with a movement of the back or the head or something like that, or even a facial expression, it's always funnier than something verbal. It goes in deeper, at a deeper level. I have been complimented on my gestures by the chief psychiatrist at Broadmoor. So. <laughs> we found her money. Where? Well, she. It doesn't matter. I'm telling you. Oh, 
ten pounds up on the deal. Ten pounds? Oh, it's, it's 95. Even if I give a ten, I'm still ten up. Bully for the first time in my life, I'm a hype. I'm winning. <laughs> Mrs. Richards, how lovely to say. Your beautiful vase that you bought yesterday has just arrived. Now, remind me, the money that you have there, is it yours or mine? I told you, it's mine. You're absolutely sure? Yes, I am. Uh, but you're still ten pounds short? Yes. Uh, boy, uh, give Mrs. Richards this, would you? What's that? This is mine. <laughs> What's that, Basil? <laughs> I think the strength of Forty Towers was the scripts and, and, and the plot and the amount of time we put into them. And they are logically consistent. And there's also a lot in them because there was so much time spent in them. And, and that's what I'm most proud of. Polly asked me to put it in the safe for her. <laughs> so that's all sorted out. Um, this is your uh, money, Polly. Uh, this is your beautiful vase, Mrs. Richards. Fonzie, you did give me that money. You won it on that horse. <laughs> <laughs> Biography's look at the life of John Cleese will continue in a moment. Only Embassy Suites hotels give you a suite with two big rooms, a free cook-to-order breakfast, and evening beverages on the house. Because only Embassy Suites is twice the hotel. Call 1-800-EMBASSY. We interrupt this broadcast. Three the All of history, all in one place. The History Channel. It's coming in the future. Six months ago, Joanne Spears broke her leg playing soccer. Playing soccer far from home. Fortunately, the Spears Blue Cross and Blue Shield plan provides easy access to medical care nationwide. Blue Cross and Blue Shield, local plans with health care options as diverse as their communities. And how was Joanne's recovery? If you can catch her, ask her. Blue Cross and Blue Shield, live long, live well. Yo, sound the bell. You recognize their style in breakdancing. You can't touch me. The Nicholas Brothers would have been a threat to a Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly. They did everything. The way they would perform and the way they would project themselves was pure class. Experience the ultimate legends in dance. The Nicholas Brothers, only on Biography. Tomorrow on a and &E. Imagine a couple of Swedish engineers have dinner with a couple of German engineers. The Swedish engineers overhearing talk about safety, while the German engineers over Bratwurst talk about the joy of driving. And what do you think they'd end up with? Probably the new Volvo 960. Now the only question is who's going to pick up the tab? The new 960 from Volvo. So while you're writing legal briefs, which batteries run your baby monitor? Um, Duracell. They last long. And uh, I assume that's your honest, candid opinion as both a mother and attorney, huh? Fair and accurate and voluntary representation. Duracell. No other battery lasts longer. Your witness. Visit your local True Value today and enter to win a 95 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Look for the Duracell display and save on long-lasting Duracell batteries. D's, C's, and 9 volts, 199. Double A's and triple A's, 249. Only at the Duracell display. Only at True Value. Health is just around the corner. We now return to biography here on A&E. You've referred a lot while we've been talking to the book you've written with Robin Skinner mm. and going into therapy. Can you tell us about that? Did you, did you become happier, more contented? Well, I guess simply became less frightened yeah. and therefore less uptight. Uh, enormous number of people are very frightened of what is in themselves and I'm much less frightened of what's in me now because I've seen some of it and you accept, all right, I have a lot of envy, I have uh, not so much jealousy, I have quite a lot of anger, which is not still available to me properly. I have a slightly depressed side, which is infinitely better, but there's still a touch of it there. I have the, but they don't frighten me anymore. Was there a sense, though, in which the fear that you had was like the lid on the cauldron that made this, drove the steam engine forward? Oh, yeah. And that taking that lid off means that uh, mm. the steam is released, but then so is the forward movement of the engine? Absolutely. I've become sort of resolutely less hardworking. And I really question now whether I feel I need to be very productive for the rest of my life. It may be that I change my mind, but uh, I don't feel any of that. 
work ethic anymore. What if I suggested that, uh, just as a suggestion, I don't know whether it's true or not, of course, is that some of your best writing came out of an unawareness mm -hmm. of what you had in your... Is that probably could be. It could be. It doesn't bother me at all. Because I know I have one particular friend who says that he does not want any psychiatry because he thinks it will affect his, his work. And for me, my life is infinitely more important than my work. And if I was given a choice between one of those very comfortable Victorian portrait painters and Van Gogh, I would take the portrait painter every time. I see no point in unnecessary suffering. Although I'm amused at a quote from Gurdjieff, which is that man will give up almost anything but his suffering. I think there's a great deal of truth in that. What was that? That was your life, mate. Oh, <laughs> that was quick. Do I get another? Sorry, mate. This should not. Although John Cleese now feels life is more important than work, he'll never abandon comedy completely. He says if comedy was good enough for Shakespeare and Mozart, it's good enough for me. And now let's see what's coming up on our next biography. They may have been Hollywood's finest dancing team, but their names are still barely known. Now learn their story in their own words and dances. The Extraordinary Lives of the Nicholas Brothers, tomorrow on Biography. I hope you'll join me and Jack Perkins weeknights here on Biography. Thanks for watching. It brought us to the brink of nuclear war. Mike Wallace takes us back to the Cuban Missile Crisis on the 20th century, tomorrow. And now the a &E Mystery Movie is next. A&E's biography has been brought to you in part by Blue Cross Blue Shield, America's unrivaled symbols of health care coverage. Live long, live well.